again, my voice is not at the top of its game, so if you could please keep the crosstalk down today. In general, the crosstalk is broken, but today especially. Okay, so for the last few classes, we've been talking about cost estimation uh, and, in general, uh, optimization in relation to database. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, cost estimation in more depth, and in particular, extending this. Uh, idea of optimization uh, to queries that include joins as well as just uh, straight single line uh, relational algebra expressions. Before I get into that though, uh, project two is going to be posted tonight. I'm going to be talking about it in more detail on Friday. Uh, the, the basic goal of the project is going to be building two indices uh, and coming up with uh, essentially accessors for those indices. Um, I'm going to give you a uh, buffer manager, essentially, uh, as well as some file I.O. primitives that work with that buffer manager. And your goal is essentially going to be to implement uh, two relatively straightforward indices. Um, and as extra credit, uh, if you're interested in obtaining that, uh, you're also uh, going to have the option of uh, building a dynamic hash or uh, tree index. Okay, so uh, that said, um, any questions? Yes. Oh, uh, sorry, it will be due uh, March 25th, which I believe is one week after spring break. Um, the midterm, ideally I'd like to have it the week before spring break, but uh, that would basically give you, uh, if I had it do the Friday immediately before spring break, that would give you about five days past the midterm. So instead, uh, you're getting a bit more time for that. Uh, okay. All right. So um, you, basically, you guys have about a month to do that. Uh, that should pretty much be enough time to, to do that, as well as the extra credit for, for, oh, yeah, yes. So project two is going to be independent of project one, project three is going to combine the two. Okay, so we've been talking about cost estimation, and the, just as a sort of recap, the uh, I.O. cost for any given relational operator is uh, something that you can estimate if you know essentially how much data you're, uh, you're working with. If you know what the size of its input is, then you can estimate roughly its I.O. cost. Um, and, well, essentially each operator has its own sort of relationship uh, to, uh, its own relationship to uh, how, how big its output size is, uh, its own relationship for how big its output size is and how big its input size is. Uh, you can typically combine these operators together using this pipelining strategy that we've been talking about for a while now and uh, essentially get an estimate of how much uh, I.O. is going to be required to perform a, a particular query, at least uh, until you consider joints. So uh, first to sort of uh, recap, but also to sort of wake your brains up a little bit, um, let's do a quick uh, analysis of uh, the sort of various types of uh, ways of accessing data and, and sort of get a sense of what the I.O. costs are involved in that. So I'm going to start you off with uh, probably the, the uh, simplest type of file, one where you have, where you know absolutely nothing about how the data is organized. Um, if you need to do a full scan of that, well, you do the full scan, you look over all of the data. Uh, if you need to do a range scan, well, you can't really do much better than that. You don't know anything about the data, so you have to look through pretty much the entire file to get every tuple that falls in that range. Uh, and similarly, if you're looking for a specific tuple, you still might have to uh, go through the entire file. Typically not the entire file, but usually most of it. Okay, so what if we have some information about that data file? What if we know that the data file is sorted? How long, did, how much uh, do we need to scan the full file? And, and, yeah. 
Uh, what about <laughs> uh, what about a range scan? Log in. Why? Binary search. Okay, so you can do a binary search to do what? To find which element? To find one, uh, one or both of the endpoints. Do you need both? Yeah, so if you find the first point in the file, uh, so you need to find the start point of the range. And from that point, you just keep scanning until you uh, go past that range. Once you go, basically, you don't need to find the upper end of the range uh, because you'll encounter that naturally just scanning through the file. Uh, what about lookup costs? Okay. Um, right. So what about a uh, static? What about a static hash index? So if we have a hash index built over a file, what's it going to take us to scan through that uh, static hash index? And okay, so it's typically going to take us, uh, that, that is actually a good estimate. Um, in general, it's actually going to be a bit worse than n because uh, the size of the hash index, uh, that is to say that the hash index is typically going to have a lot of free space um, just because you need the hash index to be much bigger than the file than the data file itself. Um, so it's going to be the size of the hash index, which is typically going to be bigger than that of the file. What about a range scan? It's not supported. Well, you typically you, uh, technically have all of the data available. Uh, full scan. Full. Uh, yeah, essentially, so it's going to be, uh, you can, you still have all of the data. In the absolute worst case, you can still do a range scan, but it's going to involve scanning over the entire file. So uh, you're go basically going to have the same cost as a full scan, slightly more than that. What about a lookup? Constant, but how many IOs? Two? Why two? Uh, so the hash table, so the hash index actually uh, doesn't do, uh, when I say hash index, I mean a dense hash index where uh, the, the values being indexed are not the record IDs, but the couples themselves. Okay. Exactly. Um, okay. What about an extendable hash index? So remember, this uh, differs from the original hash index in that you have this extra directory page that uh, points to all of the hash pages. How does that differ? Uh, how does, uh, what is the cost of, of scanning that going to be? The same? Well, we, what about, so how do we get to the individual data pages? To an is it, is it going to be all the way to 2 n or? Hmm? Uh, yes, so n plus size of the directory. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is that when that happens, uh, the up to this point, all of the accesses, all of the scans uh, have been essentially in sorted order. Uh, sorry, all of the scans have been sequential. So the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, when you're doing these data lookups, they're going to involve random uh, searches. Uh, but just to recap, you're, you're not only scanning over the data pages, you're also scanning over the directory pages. So you have to add that in. Uh, range scan? <coughs> Same thing, yes. Uh, and what about a lookup? Two, yes, because you need to first do a lookup on the directory and then look, do a lookup on the uh, data itself. Okay, a uh, couple more. Uh, what about a linear hash index? So remember this is the one where we have a uh, set of sequential pages and we grow the index uh, every single time. Same as the static hash yeah, essentially. Um, that's true for all of them. Uh, something else to keep in mind, both the static and the, the Linear hash have this idea of overflow tables. So the individual lookups are not going to always be precisely one. 
Uh, depending on how many overflow pages there are, you might have a bit more. Although typically, it's estimated as one. OK, uh, let's finish this off with, off with the two tree indices. Uh, how, it, how long does it take to do a full scan of an ISAM tree? So how does it store all of the data? Well, the, the, da the actual data pages are stored in the leaf nodes, and the leaf nodes are, how are they organized? Um, as a linked list, or? Okay. So in, uh, in, I, in an ISAM uh, tree index, the data pages are actually stored um, so that the size of the tree doesn't change. So you don't need to change the number of, of leaf nodes. You may need to create overflow pages, but the, the data pages are actually going to be stored sequentially. Um, so in fact, uh, the, the full scan cost is, well, it, it's going to be order n, but it's actually going to be a sequential scan of order n, rather than a random scan. Uh, but hold that thought for uh, one more step. Uh, what about a range scan? Uh, what's the cost going to be to do a range scan on an ISAM tree index? Uh, log base base B uh, base what? What is B over two? Or what, where do you get uh, B? Basically, how do you compute the base? What is the base based on? Yes. So essentially, how how wide? is the tree. How many pointers are there in any given tree node? How many keys can you store in any given tree node? Um, and actually, I'm noticing a typo in my slide. Uh, how many times do you need to do uh, that log end scan? Once? Yes, actually. Actually, yes. Uh, sorry, the, um, no typo. Um, you only need to do that scan once. And the same thing for a lookup. Um, and again, keeping in mind, that uh, there might be overflow pages, so you need to hit those as well. Um, that's the, the, the twiddle means approximately uh, because of the overflow pages. All right, what about a B plus tree? Last one. What's the uh, full scan going to be for a B plus tree? Why log in? Uh, how is the data organized in a B plus tree? Same thing. Or so can the number of leaf nodes change in a B plus tree? Yes. So is it reasonable to store it as a sequential? No. How is it stored? As a linked list. Okay. How long does it take to traverse a linked list? N. Uh, exactly, but in this case, it's going to be and random scans, and you have to load each page. You can't load uh, page two until after you've loaded page one. So there's a bit of a sequential uh, buffering problem there as well. Um, <coughs> what about uh, range scans? How long is it going to take us to do a range scan? Uh, yep, it's going to be the same thing. Except in this case, uh, we don't have overflow pages, so it's going to be precisely that. Um, and a lookup. Okay, so uh, here you have basically the big table of index access costs. Um, and this will get you essentially any sort of uh, lookup on any sort of skin, any sort of uh, selection predicate on. Uh, a single variable, a sort of inequality or equality selection predicate on a single variable. So, that said, yes?
3 the size never changes in, in an ISAM. Uh, an ISAM index is, is completely static. The, the tree size never changes. Um, the leaf pages are all stored sequentially on, on this. You, you build them, you build the, the uh, leaf node, the leaf pages once, and then uh, all of the leaf pages are, are just stored sequentially. If you run out of space, you might need to create overflow nodes. There's a cost associated with uh, following the overflow nodes, but um, the leaf pages themselves are are all they're sorry overflow pages. I'm sorry, um, but the, the unless you're talking about if there are no overflow pages, then it's just a sequential scan of, of the, the file. How about B? So in a B plus tree. Uh, the number of, of leaf nodes can vary and can change. So you do need to sort of some sort of have some sort of dynamic structure. And in that case, yes, there is a a, uh, a linked list of leaf pages. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Okay. So uh, so far we've basically considered Primarily operators that um, uh, are sort of very restricted, two very restricted classes of operators. Uh, we've talked about uh, projection and selection, which can be pipelined and have this, this sort of reduction factor associated with them. Uh, they reduce the amount of data. Uh, we've also talked about non pipelined operators uh, that have certain I.O. costs associated with them. Uh, but as it turns out, a join can have a bit of both. Um, you can have a join changes the output size clearly. Uh, and so we need a way of estimating the size of the output of a join. Um, but a join can also involve a considerable, a considerable amount of I.O. as well. So we'd like to be able to uh, estimate the I.O. cost of a join as well. So let's start with um, the first of those questions. How do we pick the size, determine the size of uh, the output of the tool. Any thoughts? Yes. Okay, so you can get, uh, you have uh, an expansion of attributes. Um, so that's one change. What about the, the change in the number of rows? Exactly. So, um, Actually, right ahead of me. Um, right, so the um, you end up with uh, when computing a uh, a join, you're essentially computing a cross product, and a cross product uh, ends up having uh, the the product of the two um, uh, the sizes of the two inputs. Now, a join is essentially a restricted form of the cross product, uh, where uh, where you have what else? Selection, yes. Uh, so you have a, uh, a join is, is basically a selection on top of the cross product. So you essentially assume uh, you start with the worst case uh, scenario where the join is the cross product, and then you compute its output using a reduction factor based on that selection predicate. So if you can compute that reduction factor, uh, which we went over last week, uh, sorry, Monday, um, then we can estimate the output size the join itself based on that. Okay, uh, any questions on this? Okay, so we can, we can estimate the output size of the join uh, fairly easily. Uh, what about the I.O. cost of the join? Well, it's, uh, well, the uh, I.O. cost actually depends on a number of things. Um, First off, it depends on what join algorithm we're using, and it depends on what kind of properties uh, we can assume uh, about the data. Um, so I'm going to get to those in, in just a moment, but first I want to uh, do a quick detour, because there's, there's sort of a related, a question that's very uh, closely related uh, a question whose answer is very closely related uh, to, to these two 
questions here. Um, so I want to sort of uh, ask that question first. Um, and that's how do we pick, uh, how do we deal with multiple joins in the query? Um, so if I were to give you this, this sort of very arbitrary uh, join query where I'm taking four relations and joining them together, um, how many different ways can I organize them together in a, uh, in a query? So I mean, I could do a couple of things. I could uh, group them together like this. I could group them together like that. But then I can sort of rearrange this as I see fit. There's a huge number of different possibilities, a huge number of different possible ways that I could uh, join these things together. And many of them are actually equivalent. Um, Loosely speaking, uh, the way that you can sort of compute this is that if I start, I can pick four different ways to start, and I can join that, uh, sorry, you can think of this as, as essentially clustering, uh, picking ways to, to pair them together. So I start with R, join S, join T, join U. And at the very beginning, what I want to do is pick a pair of these to join together. So I can pick any two of those to join together. And I have, uh, what should we call it? I have um, two, four, times three different pairs to choose from. Let's say I pick that pair. Um, well, now I have three different options. <coughs> And I can pick any of those three uh, to join together. So for each of these possibilities, I now have another three times two possibilities. Let's say I join these two together. Well, now I have two more things I can join together. So I have right. Uh, so there's uh, there's the mirror image. Um, I'm actually double counting here, but it's essentially going to be uh, for each of these, for, um, divide everything by two. And then two, and one, two, and we have one possibility. Um, essentially, there are going to be n minus one factorial uh, different ways of evaluating this joint. Um, you're not necessarily responsible for knowing that. The, what you do need to know, though, is that computing the cost is expensive. Um, there are lots of different plans. If we try and explore all, every single one of those plans, then we're going to run into trouble, because that's extremely expensive. And if we're trying to give the user an interactive experience, then um, trying to compute all of that as we're compiling the query is not really feasible. So what can we do about it? And as it turns out, the answer to that question is actually very closely related to this question of um, how we estimate the cost of the joy. Um, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, is there a number of there? Yes. <coughs> so um, a strategy that's was sort of pioneered by the system art optimizer is this idea of less left deep plans. Uh, loosely speaking, the right hand side of the right hand side of a join is always going to be a relation. Uh, so we end up with a plan that is, a, is essentially gets deeper on the left, but never on the right. Now this has two effects. First off, it helps the the, the, the second of those questions by dramatically reducing the search space. Uh, for join plans. As it turns out, there's only a linear number of join plans that need to be explored in this case. Um, but it also gives us the ability to uh, perform uh, certain kinds uh, it also gives us the ability to perform certain kinds of index scans and lookups. Uh, a nested loop, a nested index, a nested index join uh, can only be performed if you have an index sitting on the right hand side. Sorry? 
so the question is, what do I mean by uh, shrinking the join search space? Um, the, the answer is that this restricts us to certain kinds of join plans. Um, so before, we had this factorial number of different ways of performing the join. Um, in this case, because we're restricting ourselves uh, to uh, essentially always building, um, always building, uh, so we, we have a join plan, we always add one relation to it. Uh, yes, exactly. So we don't have to explore as many different plans. And that's all the time. Off the top of my head, I can't tell you. I believe it's linear. Um, um, so you start up. Sorry, it's going to be quadratic. So in the worst case, it would be quadratic if you restrict yourself. If you restrict yourself to joins that can be um, that can be performed with. Uh, so certain, certain plans can be eliminated right off the bat. Uh, so for example, if S and U don't have any attributes that uh, any join, if there's no join condition uh, that joins S and U, then this join is meaningless. Um, if you, like for example, R, uh, where R and S join, uh, R and S share an attribute, uh, S and T share an attribute, and T and U share an attribute, and there's a, a sort of clear sequence of, of uh, joins that you can perform. And in that case, the only question is where do you start and um, which order do you uh, You can essentially, if you, uh, so there's what's known as a linear join. Uh, Uh, any, indi any indices that you have built over that 
um, object. Uh, so you can do some, something like an index nested loop join, or um, if the right hand side relation fits in memory, then you can load it in and do an index nested, uh, I'm sorry, a, a nested loop um, or a hybrid hash join on it, which is typically going to be a bit faster. Um, so with that said, um, are there any questions? Okay. Um, so let's do another one of these uh, big, um, uh, let's go over the algorithm kind of things. Uh, so this, so which of the, the join algorithms that we've talked about so far fit into this uh, paradigm uh, where we have a pipeline query on the left hand side and a relation on the right hand side. Um, so let's start with hybrid hash join. Um, does that support this pipelining approach? So sir, uh, how, how does hybrid hash join work? Can I get in? How does hybrid hash join work? So you build a uh, hash table in memory. Yes, exactly. So you don't have to 
get over the entire table. If you have an index built over uh, the right hand side, then you only have to scan over those the, the tuple. You can use the index to find the, the matching tuples immediately. So this is, a, this is essentially similar to the hybrid hash join, and it supports pipelining in the same way. Uh, but is there, <coughs> what's the, <coughs> excuse me, what's the catch? And this is a fairly, uh, uh, well, uh, what do you need in order to perform an index nested loop join? An index, exactly. So if you don't have that index, well, too bad. Um, okay, what about a sort merge join? Does that support pipelining? Yes. Yes. So the sort merge join actually uh, is one of the is the only join algorithm that supports pipe pipelining on not just one side but both sides. Um, what's the catch? Yeah. So the the data needs to be sorted, and if the data isn't sorted, you have to do a sort. Um, if you're talking about the right hand side, you can do you can uh, sort of pre-compute the sort. Um, but if you need to sort the right if you need to sort the right hand side, you can do that before evaluating the entire query. You can just sort the table, store that somewhere, and then it's ready when you actually need to perform the join. But the left hand side, if the left hand side isn't sorted, then you're going to have to uh, basically uh, compute everything, then sort it, and then uh, and then and only then can you perform the sort of merge join. All right, what about what about a block nested or a nested loop join? Um, is that does that support pipelining? Yes. Oh, actually, yes. Um, so uh, there, this is this is probably the strongest caveat. Um, a nested loop join can support pipelining but under a very, 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 very strong condition, which is? Exactly, so the second table, if the second table doesn't fit memory, then uh, nested loop join can't be done in a pipeline event. Otherwise, you have to resort to something like a block nested loop join, which forces you to uh, write uh, the entire left hand side out to disk first. Um, okay, and finally, hash join. Does a hash join support pipelining? This is where we uh, write, uh, create the hash table uh, from both sides first, write that out to disk. Yep. Okay. So, in order to do a hash join, you actually do have to write everything out to disk. Um, there is nothing you can do about that. On the other hand, it's uh, probably the most efficient way of not doing a pipeline uh, implementation for us. So, yeah, pretty much no, uh, no buts about that. The hash join, pretty much by its very nature, uh, always materializes everything. Okay. Um, let's see, so I actually covered this example. Um, can we use a hybrid hash join throughout this entire thing? I heard this example like 30 seconds ago. No. Um, so what can we do about that? Let's say we did. Let's say that uh, S, T, and U were all actually really, really small. What could we do about it? while we do that 
uh, that materialization. And by materialization, I basically mean just write out the results to disk. But, okay. Um, so long story short. Yes. Um, if we wanted to do a nested loop join ST and, sorry, if we wanted to do a nested loop join in a pipeline manner, uh, then ST and U would all have to be in memory at the same time. And that's true for both the hybrid hash and the nested loop join. The hybrid hash would actually take up a little more memory because you also have to have the hash table itself. Okay, um, any questions on this? Why this is not possible? Okay, um, so last thing of the day. One more of these, uh, you guys are gonna be sick of these by the day, uh, time the day is over. This is, I know you guys are sick of these, but uh, this is the last one, I swear. Um, we've got, uh, let's say we're doing a join between R and S. Um, we want to be able to estimate the I.O. cost of doing one of these joints. And so far, you basically have more than, uh, more or less enough information uh, to compute that. So for a hybrid hash joint, what is the cost going to be of our joint S? And why? That isn't on the slides. <laughs> So how, what is it, uh, what is the, the cost of hybrid hash? Right, it's gonna be the cost of the smaller relation, why? Because Yeah, because you have to read it in once, at least once to hash. Uh, index nested loop. That one might be trickier. So what do you need to do for an index nested loop joint? So the index is already built on the, the, the small, or one of the two relations. So what do you need to do uh, for the join itself? So you need to do a lookup on the index, how many times? Once for, once for every couple in the bigger of the two relations. Um, so in the absolute worst case, uh, for every tuple in the bigger relation, you have to do one scan or lookup on S. But uh, typically, you're going to have some sort of uh, nicer caching properties going on. At the very least, you're going to start. You're going to keep the index in memory. So this is not necessarily going to be quite as bad. Um, sort merge join. So let's say you let's say the, you've already uh, you've already paid the cost of loading R in somewhere. What's the cost of? Okay, so you're gonna have to uh, so yeah you're going to have to pay the cost of sorting S, and then you're going to have to pay the cost of reading S in. Um, S to loop. <coughs> So you paid the cost of loading up R, what's the I.O. cost of, and you also have to pay the cost of loading S. Yes. Uh, block tested loop. This one's a little messier. So how many, um, what's the cost of, so how does a block nested loop join work? Uh, huh? How does a block nested loop join work? Do a, nest, a nested loop over uh, pairs of, of blocks of each relation. So you're going to have to, uh, so how many of those, uh, what is the cost of doing a, um, right, so then you get the number of blocks of S, the number of blocks of R, and, 
is actually a slight typo here. Um, this should be the number of pages per block. Um, okay, and last one, hash join, straight up hash join. What's that? What's the cost going to be for that? So what do we do to all of the couples of R? Okay, so we're going. It, well, it's going to be the cost of the, the number of pages of R and the number of pages of S. But we're going to have to uh, do what to that? We have to first write everything out, and then we still have to read it back in. So the total cost is going to be uh, twice the total cost. Okay. Uh, oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so basically, to summarize the last two lectures, um, we have this huge space of, of different query plans that we can uh, search over, um, and really we've been exploring. Uh, sort of two orthogonal questions. The first is, how do we get to the data in the most efficient way that, that's possible? And once we have the data that we're interested in, how do we sort of combine it with other data in the more, most efficient way possible? So how do we, uh, how do we exploit um, projection and selection equivalencies, and how do we exploit joint equivalencies uh, to um, create a, a, a range of different possible query plans. Um, now for each of the plans that we've created, um, a traditional optimizer is going to then uh, compute the cost of each of those plans, and then try and figure out which plan has the lowest cost. Um, a key portion of that is, trying, uh, is estimating the size of each output. Um, <coughs> One other major challenge in this is that these uh, joint equivalencies provide us with a huge space of, of possible plans to look over. And so, in order to simplify that search space, uh, we're going to look at precisely the, uh, only the joins, uh, only these, these left deep joint plans. So, uh, that said, um, any questions? All right, well, um, we have to, uh, project two posted tonight, homework two on Monday, and uh,